Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, so the question number one is as follows. Dear Ajahn, why does a stream enter who has seen non-self still have anger and ill will? How does non-self differ from the high factors of ego and conceit? So the, uh, <clears throat> the problem for the, uh, uh, the stream enter is that they have only changed their view. Yeah, it is, that's why it's called Sakaya Ditti. It is the view of uh, um, an existing personality or an, a, a view of, of the identity, which is the problem. So they still, even though they have that view, there is still a lingering feeling inside of them of I am, yeah? So sometimes they think in terms of I am, sometimes they feel in terms of I am, sometimes they perceive in terms of I am. And there is a nice sutta, a Kemaka sutta, found in the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, which talks about this particular problem. And it says it is a bit like a, if you have a, uh, if you have a, how does it go again? A chest, a chest of clothes, yeah, a clothes kind of packed in a chest. And you have washed them, and you have washed them in India in those days. You washed things in, in cow dung. So you wash them in cow dung. They still have the smell of cow dung. But then you leave them in the chest for a while. You use uh, perfumes and all of these kind of things. And eventually the smell of cow dung disappears. Uh, in the same way, the sense of self, even though you have washed uh, yourself in a sense by becoming a stream enter, you're given up the view there is still this underlying feeling of perception, I am, is still inside of you. And that is the difference between a stream entry and arahanship, is a difference between letting go of Sakaya Ditti and letting go of the ego conceit, the Asmi Mana, which is the uh, deeper factor, is that when you let go of the complete conceit, uh, that is when you don't even feel I am anymore. You have no perception, I am. You have no thought, I am. And this is really what this is. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, going on here. It's called the Kemaka Sutra, exactly. So um, that is the difference. So because a stream mantra hasn't really gone, let go of the entire conceit yet, uh, it means that uh, um, uh, anger and ill will can still happen as a consequence. Yeah, because if as long as the I am is there and you have a feeling I am, then it means that. Uh, uh, ill will comes as a consequence of that. Uh, so the Kemaka Sangyutta from uh, Wayin is um, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya 2289. Uh, so the 22nd Sangyutta, the Sangyutta Ambas, and the 89th Sutta in there. Uh, so that is what uh, how, how this works. And only when you kind of overcome that conceit more profoundly, not completely, but more profoundly, especially when you become an anagami, then, then ill will and anger uh, stop completely, as does the uh, desire for sensory objects. Because when you become an anagami, uh, all that you are left, all you are interested in is the uh, world of samadhi. You have let go of any interest in the world of karma. So the I am is still there, but it is related to a very tiny area of uh, uh, you know, the samadhi experience, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that is uh, the difference between the stream enter and the, the arahant, is the depth to which you have let go of the idea of I am. So, uh, but if you ask a stream enter, if you ask them, is there a self? They will always say there is no self. They, they will have understood it. The view is like that. You know, this, is, this is how they think about things. So it's a bit like um, if, if someone asks you if you are a Buddhist, yeah, you have the view that if you are a Buddhist, uh, it means that you, you know, if someone asks you, you always say, I'm a Buddhist. But uh, sometimes you forget, yeah, in your daily life, you walk around, you don't always think about the fact that you are a Buddhist. Sometimes your mind may go astray, you may fantasize about being a Christian, perhaps even, you may think about what it might be like to be a Muslim, even, I don't know what you might fantasize about. Uh, but if someone asks you, you will always say that you are a Buddhist. Uh, there's a difference between your thought patterns and, and how you view things, how you, how you look at the world. Okay, let's go to question number two. Dear Ajahn, according to the practicing right speech, how to tell the truth without hurting people's feelings? Thank you. 
Um, so uh, remember that, that uh, it is not just about telling the truth. Yeah, it's, it's about knowing when to tell the truth. Uh, it's about knowing. It's about being skillful in these kind of things. Uh, and uh, you don't always have to blurt out the truth and kind of you know. Sometimes you can even use the truth as a weapon you can say yeah i'm going to tell you the truth yeah i'm going to really get you with the truth you can use the truth as a weapon and if you use the truth as a weapon it is actually unwholesome it is bad the truth isn't always good it depends on your intention your motivation and this is one of the important things to always remember about kamma and about morality is that morality in buddhism is really about how you intend what it is that you want to so um, uh, if you want to, you know, if you tell, if you want to tell someone the truth, sometimes it is about time and place. Yeah, it is about understanding when they need to hear something. Yeah? It is about, and it's about saying, well, not, not now. Yeah, but now I, I'm too busy, or now is not not the right time, or whatever. You know that sometimes it is it is not appropriate to tell the truth. Though. And uh, very occasionally, yeah, in certain instances, it might even be okay to lie. Yeah, there may be certain times that if uh, coming from compassion, for example, in very uh, special circumstances where you have to speak in one way or another, uh, you sometimes you have to um, talk about, you have to say things that, um, uh, that, you know, you have to sometimes say things that even might be untrue, simply because otherwise it might cause even bigger problems. So, and I'll give you an example. This is an example that Adam Brown uh, taught many years ago. And this is the example of a woman. She had a husband who was going to have a bypass surgery. And he was lying in the hospital room. Uh, and in the hospital room was another man. He was also having bypass surgery. Uh, and uh, then this other man, he gets wheeled into the operation theater. He has his operation. And then he dies during the operation. There's, some, there's a small percentage of people that die during bypass operation, very small percentage, but it does happen. Uh, and then his wife comes to visit him in hospital, the, the man who is still living. And uh, then when they're talking, he asks her, how did, what happened to my friend? And uh, then she replies, oh, don't worry about him, he's okay. Yeah, so then she, she is lying. But uh, of course, the point is that if she had told him the truth at that time, uh, he might have really been worried. He might have really been concerned about his procedure. So in a situation like that, it might be better yeah, to tell something that is untrue or that is not directly true anyway. Maybe he was okay. Maybe he had a happy rebirth. You know, <laughs> It depends what you, what you mean by being okay. You could argue. But uh, sometimes lying, if you're coming from compassion, if you're coming from uh, a right place, may occasionally be okay. But be careful whenever you are, you know, lying, whenever you are going against the precepts, it's like a red light. It should make you stop for a short time and ask yourself whether it's really required. Sometimes it is better to, uh, to find an excuse. Yeah, this is not the right time or whatever. And then uh, kind of get out of it in that way. So absolutely, you should take care of people's feelings. That is a very important part, yeah? Otherwise, we are just callous, hard-hearted. And that goes against the idea of right intention as well, because you are doing hurtful things. And being hurtful to others is also wrong intention. So you have to, that is also wrong, yeah? So you have to navigate all of these things in the right way. And then you are thinking rightly about this. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, dear Tan Arjan, before arriving at the third fruition, do we still need to make use of uh, I am for contemplation and reflections? Uh, reflections like I am, let me see here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, reflections like I am subject to illness, is it considered a proper attention as part of our practice? So, well, the, uh, uh, remember that even the, the Buddha sometimes uses the word I, yeah, especially when he speaks to ordinary people, he uses words I and you and, and these kind of things. Uh, and very often these things are just used as shorthands. They're used as a way of talking about the world uh, because you can talk about I am as just a reference to these five kandhas. Uh, 
these five khandas are here. Uh, they have a certain history, they may have a certain future, they have a certain present. Uh, and because of that, it is this five khandas that I think of when I talk about I am. Uh, and I don't take anything to be permanent in those five khandas, but it's very convenient to refer to these five khandas in terms of I am. So yes, you can use reflections like I am subject to illness all the way to arahantship, yeah? Reminding yourself, knowing very full well that what you are referring to is just the five khandas. You know that, but you use it as a convenient shorthand. And even arahants can do that, but of course arahants, they don't need the reflection, I am subject to illness. Arahants will use I am in a, in a slightly different way now. So indeed, Dear Ajahn, does the Sotapanna still have the notion I am? Yes, they still have the notion I am. The, the notion just means the thought, it means the perception. So they will sometimes they will think like that. But if you ask them, yeah, if you ask for their view, is there a self? Is there an I in here? Is there a permanent aspect to the person? They will always deny that because the view will be right. And this is where you have to uh, distinguish between view and feelings. Views and uh, thought processes These are not the same thing. They function in different ways. Uh, so a sotapanna, a stream entry, will certainly still think in that way. Yeah. Dear Ajahn, please elaborate on misapprehension, apprehension of precepts and observances. Uh, is that similar to dependence on wrong uh, rites and rituals? Thank you. Um, sometimes uh, sila, the Pali word here is sila bhatta paramasa, and uh, sometimes that is translated as grasping rites and rituals, and actually it is a wrong translation, because sila, we all know sila means virtue, yeah, it means precepts or virtue or morality or something like that, uh, yeah. Uh, bhatta is a, a Pali word which means bhatta, and it comes from um, the idea of an observance or something that we do in daily life. Yeah, we do many observances. We maybe we light incense or we shake hands or we sit down to meditate. Or these are like this is quite close to rituals. Yeah, it is not that far away, but uh, it is it can be more meaningful than ritual. Ritual is sounds like something very empty, but an observance like meditation, for example, is not really just a ritual. It is also Ideally, it is also a development of the mind. Meditation can become a ritual. Yeah, it can become like, oh, every morning I meditate because I have to, I, I have to be a good Buddhist, so I have to meditate every morning. Sometimes people think like that. And after a while, it becomes a ritual. You just do it because you think you are supposed to do doing it. And you don't really gain any benefit. Yeah, you're just tired, you're nodding away. It doesn't really work then it can become a ritual tumor, which doesn't really do anything for you. Or you bow down to the Buddha statue. It can become also like, almost like a ritual. You don't really mean anything with it. You don't actually really respect the Buddha or anything like that. But you, you just do these things in an empty kind of way. So, um, uh, so these things can become uh, rituals and they can become uh, problematic, but really sila bhatta it means any observance that you do, like meditation practice or uh, or your uh, virtues in daily life and, and all of these kind of things, and, and uh, that is uh, so that is really uh, what it is referring to. So the point here is that virtue has to be attached to to some extent. Yeah, you have to apprehend these things, you have to grasp them to some extent, you have to depend on them to some extent. Uh, and the reason is because if we don't grasp them, if you don't hold on to them, basically we're not going to be able to fulfill them. Yeah? If you don't say, okay, I'm not going to lie, then you will probably lie sometimes because most people lie sometimes because it is very convenient to lie sometimes. Or if you say, if you don't say, if you don't make a determin determination not to drink, well, you probably will drink. Yeah? So we have to grasp the, these things somewhat. Then when you become a stream enter, you don't do these things anymore because you know that these things are, uh, are problematic. Yeah? So you don't do them in the same way. And that is the, uh, uh, what you want to do. Uh, 
Okay, so let me, I hope that is clear. If it is not clear, then please, uh, can you please scroll me back why into the previous question? I just want to make sure I have read it properly. Yeah, so exactly. So it's really apprehension that is the problem. And one of the things I should also maybe say is that uh, um, uh, uh, sometimes people think that these things are the things that we need to do. Yeah, we need to uh, stop grasping precepts and observances. We need to stop grasping the sealer because if we stop grasping, Aspect, then we are practicing in the right way. We are practicing to give these things up. Yeah, but uh, it's important to understand that this is not a practice. Uh, yeah, and when the Buddha says that when you become a stream entry, you don't grasp precepts and observances, he's not saying that this is a path. This is what you should be doing. He's saying this is a result. Yeah, so it is quite different. So this does not say anything about uh, uh, how you should do things. Uh, um, uh, rather, it is uh, about uh, what the result is of uh, the practice. Uh, yeah? So it, it, by stopping to grasp the precepts, actually, it is counterproductive. It is not going to work. Uh, rather, you should just wait uh, until these things uh, disappear on their own. And in the meantime, uh, you should keep on grasping at least a little bit, uh, because that will enable you uh, to do these things. Uh, okay. Next one. Dear Ajahn, you say, I perceive not self with what is not self is right view. I think I get what you mean. However, I have difficulty wrapping my head around this as the phrase I perceive itself is problematic because there is no I that, who per that perceives. Who perceives? Uh, yeah, quite right. Yeah, so uh, who perceives is the wrong question. Then. And uh, the Buddha is asked these questions in the suttas, and he says it's the wrong question because uh, it is uh, it is not really answerable. The right question would be what perceives, because it is perception that perceives. Yeah, it is this five khandas. These five khandas perceive themselves. The mind perceives itself in a certain way. That's what what is going on here. Yeah. So uh, uh, if you take your experience right now, yeah, it is. Yeah, you're experiencing something, uh, and uh, that experience is not self-experience that you're having right now. There's just a delusion added on top of that experience, and that delusion is the feeling that you exist in a permanent way. You exist in a certain way because these five khandas, they are here, but they don't exist in the way that you think they exist. They exist in a more simple way so it is non-self right now. It is non-self that perceives non-self. This is what's happening in each one of us right now. And it doesn't feel like that. It feels like there is an I doing the perceiving, but that sense, that perception of an I, that is precisely the false perception. Yeah, that is not actually there. So just allow that to mature in your mind and then eventually you will probably see this more clearly. Okay. Next question, dear Ajahn, how can we practice speaking kindly, honestly, and directly without the person feeling criticized or come across as harsh speech when we see someone with a behavior that might harm them or their relationship with others, etc., such as frequently being late? Um, uh, what you, what we have to do is that you have to uh, try to speak with kindness, yeah, and you have to try to maybe make them understand that it causes problems to you and problems to others. And maybe that can make them feel a sense of compassion. Yeah, if you, if you say that, oh, this is really painful, it's very hurtful when you do this and it causes so problems for so many people, can you please be, can you please, uh, you know, try to change it? And sometimes if you ask people to be compassionate, they will live up to that, uh, uh, that demand because everybody wants to be compassionate to some degree. If we understand that we are hurting others, we don't really want to hurt others. So that is one way of doing that. They're saying it in a way whereby um, you, know, you are asking for, the, for, for compassion from the other person. Um, make sure that when you say these things, that you say it, uh, giving the, you have to always 
come from a sense of wanting happiness for yourself and also for the other person. Right? If you come as come across as critical, then the other person is very unlikely to listen to what you have to say. Yeah, so you have to come across in a way that you are caring for them. You're caring for yourself. You're caring for the other person. You're caring for the one who is uh, who are the ones who are suffering from the lateness or whatever. Uh, and if you do that, then eventually then there is some chance that you will be able to uh, get through. Uh, but remember that it is very difficult to change habits. Uh, some people have very strong habits of being late, and, and uh, it is a often it is like a psychological thing that they have built up over a very long time, uh, and it can be very very difficult to change. Uh, for you, you might think, "Oh, it's nothing. It's easy. I can be early, so surely they can be early as well." Uh, but it doesn't work like that. But, yeah, it is for some people, it's actually very hard to be early. I think you can read about this online. There have been psychological studies into these kind of things, and, and they find it impossible to be on time. Yeah, you, you, you think it may sound strange to the rest of us. But actually, they find it very, very hard. So have compassion for that person as well, and even though they're hurting others. Uh, understand that for them, it is actually very difficult to change, and they may not be able to change. Sometimes you may have to change your behavior around them. You have to kind of fit in with what they are doing here, simply because they are unable to do it. And uh, so have compassion because people never really do things because they want to be bad. Nobody wants to be bad. Everyone wants to be kind. Why? Because we know that kindness is happiness for ourselves. So, so if people are, don't do the right thing, very often it means that they are trapped. Yeah, they are trapped in a certain habit trapped in a certain way of doing things. Maybe it is some kind of ego mechanism that causes you to be late. Um, and then if you look at it that way, if you have compassion all the way around, it is also easier to find a solution to the problem, yeah? Uh, whatever that solution might be. Maybe you can start the meeting a little bit later, or you can do something in the meantime, or you wait for this person, or I don't know what. Maybe there is an alternative solution to the problem rather than trying to get the person to be on time, because that may just be impossible to make that happen. Okay. Uh, dear Arjan, the ego part and attachment to my last job is still very strong in me. During meditation, lots of thinking of the past keeps arising. Uh, great, I'm, I'm glad you recognize that. This is kind of very typical, yeah? I recognize this, but can't find an effective way to abandon it. I appreciate Ajahn's advice. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult. And um, I, I, I think what you have to remember is that, you know, think about yourself on your deathbed. Yeah, you're going to die one day. You don't know when the death, death is going to happen. Uh, and when you die, are you going to think about that job or are you going to let go of that job? And the answer is that on our deathbed, the, all of these things become pointless. Yeah? They become completely irrelevant. Who cares about your past job on your deathbed? Yeah? But in a re very real sense, you are already on your deathbed. Death can happen at any time. Yeah? It can happen so fast. We have no idea when it's going to happen. Yeah? So the reality is that now is the time to give it up. Yeah? Don't wait till you're gonna die, it's gonna be too late. If you are already on your deathbed, then now is the time to give it up. That is one way of thinking about it. Another way to think about it is that in the past lives, you had the similar kind of problems. Yeah? In the past lives, you have also lost a job yeah? uh, or whatever. Uh, but what is your relationship to that lost job now? There's nothing, yeah, it's in the past life. You don't even remember it anymore. Huh? But uh, at that time, you may have felt exactly like you're doing now, thinking about it a lot, uh, uh, the past coming back to you. Huh? And yet now, when you look at it now, it seems completely irrelevant in the long run. Uh, and so the answer is in the long run, that job is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You're going to forget about it. It's going to disappear anyway. And if it is going to disappear anyway in the long run, you might as well give it up now. It is nothing. It is, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't create, it never created, and it will not create any uh, real happiness for you anyway. Uh, so um, that is one way, another way of thinking about it. Uh, and um, 
it really depends a little bit on the, you know what it is that your problem is with this last job but, but uh, sometimes if you lose a job some people say yay i lost my job now i can spend more time doing good things uh, i can do more meditation i can spend more time doing a bit of charity work i can help my parents and help people out uh, i can go more to the bgf i can do whatever it is yeah all kind of stuff uh, so you just uh, remind yourself that new opportunities come around uh, and maybe those new opportunities will be better than the old ones. Uh, like as Abraham always says, good, bad, who knows? Yeah, often we think that we know that something is bad, but actually we don't really know that. Uh, maybe it, things will turn out for the better. Uh, it is like, um, you know, so many times in my life, I thought things were really bad and terrible. And in the long run, actually, it turned out to be good. Yeah, I learned something from that. Uh, Every time you have a difficulty in your life, you can learn something. You can learn something about the impermanence of things, about the problems of the world. There's nothing there to hold on to. It is always going to be impermanent, always going to be problematic. Let it all go. Move forward on the spiritual path. That is what you learn in the long run. So just gradually, gradually, yeah, these things don't happen straight away, but try to think in that this, this kind of way, and then hopefully gradually you will uh, be able to uh, let go of that. Okay, dear Ajahn, regarding giving, when we share information which is copyrighted and we had not asked for permission to share, but we think it is helpful for another person, is that considered the priest breaking the precept of stealing, although with sincere intention to help another? Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know. It really depends on the uh, situation. Yeah, information is copyrighted. I guess it depends on how much information it is and uh, all, all kinds of things. Um, sometimes remember that copyright. They have also they have a limited applicability. It, it, you are usually allowed to share a certain amount of material, ten percent for educational purposes or private uses and these kind of things. Uh, so try to use the, the legal system yeah, as it is and see if we can share these things in a way that is uh, legal. Yeah, there's quite a few loopholes in the copyright law and they are there on purpose to make it possible for people to share things. So um, uh, uh, in the end, if, you know, if it is a big thing like a movie or a book or something and you share the whole book knowing that it is copyrighted material, then it probably is not such a good idea, yeah, because it is supposed to be bought and, uh, and to give the author uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, revenue so he can kind of, or they can carry on work, do, do their work. So be, just be reasonable about it. Find that middle way, which usually works for everyone. Uh, don't be super strict and kind of rigid about copyright, uh, but also know when you go too far, when clearly that you are depriving the author of a, uh, some income because you're copywriting large amounts of material or whatever, uh, and then uh, think of another way of doing things. But uh, you cannot steal to share. Generally speaking, if you steal and share, it is still stealing. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's say that like, someone has ten dollars and you know someone who really needs those ten dollars, uh, you take those ten dollars and give it to someone else. Obviously, it is not right. Yeah. And the same thing with copyright, it's not, it's not okay to breach it simply to give to another. Uh, you would have to ask yourself how you breach that copyright. So do it in a, in a wise way within the bounds of what is reasonable. Uh, number 10, Suki Hotu I would like to seek your advice on past life regression therapy. How accurate is it? From the Dhamma talks that I've heard, one can only know the past life when he or she attains jhana. Hence, I'm skeptical to how a therapist can help us identify our past lives. So, yes, I, I agree with you. There is a good grounds for being skeptical. Uh, there's a lot of this past life regression this to our uh, dodgy. Yeah, and, uh, and like I mentioned before, sometimes you go to a past life regression, uh, regression therapist uh, and they tell you that you were a famous person in the past. Well, as soon as you hear you are a famous person in the past, well, then that is enough to doubt what is going on. 
But I just because it is doubtful doesn't necessarily mean that it is always wrong. Yeah, there may be times when it actually works. And I have heard of certain instances of people who, like I mentioned before, who had the past life regression and they remembered lots and lots of details of their life. And then they tried to figure out whether such a person actually existed and they found that it existed. So occasionally it is possible that you may be able to tap into a real memory, yeah? But as you say, it is unreliable. So we don't really know how often it is true or not. Maybe one out of 10 cases, it may work a little bit, maybe more often one out of five, I have no idea. But a lot of the time it will be wrong, I agree with you. And as you said, the best way to do it is to get into a jhana state first, yeah? then definitely you will be able to remember your past lives uh, in a very accurate way. Um, I have the intention to try this therapy with hopes of understanding my relationship with my family and to help me with my past trauma. But at the back of my mind, I have this doubt. And after hearing your explanation just now, my doubt has increased. I appreciate your guidance. Um, it is very, you know, it, it can be useful. And uh, sometimes I think, you know, sometimes what happens is that even if the memory isn't exactly right, some of the things that come out, some of the things that you um, re remember, yeah, even though it is not a memory, the things that actually you say when you are in the therapy, there may still be things that are very heavy for you or very difficult. It may be that some of the things that come out may still help you to understand yourself, yeah? because we tend to talk about things that if they come out involuntarily, it's like our subconscious emerges. Yeah? And then we talk about things that deep down are problematic for us. So, so it may still be worthwhile doing it. Maybe something positive will come out of it. Yeah? So it is, it is hard, to, hard to really say. So if it is something that, you know, you can afford and it's it's not kind of super expensive or whatever and it is something that might work yeah. maybe maybe give it a shot uh, and maybe you have some interesting uh, ideas about your past life at the same time uh, what imagine if it works if it does work it will be extraordinarily interesting uh, you can find out something about your past you can find out maybe um, maybe uh, you know you, you you get a better grasp of yourself of who you are as a person maybe it will improve your spiritual practice because if you really do see a past life uh, then it might actually be a great push to moving you forward uh. so i would see it if i were you not only see it as a therapy but see it as like a adventure yeah, an adventure in uh, trying to understand yourself better and getting a more profound idea of your personality and who you are uh. Anyway, I wish you good luck with that. Uh, next question. Ajahn, what is your view on the culling of millions of minks in Denmark to curb the spread of COVID-19? Are the lives of minks animals less important than that of humans? Similarly, in a life and death situation when one needs to decide between saving an elderly person versus a young child? How does one decide or choose without judgment? Uh, how does one act morally when confronted with such ethical dilemmas? Thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, yes, it is very unfortunate, the culling of millions of links. Uh, and sometimes you wonder whether it is really required. Uh, yeah, they did that in Denmark. There was a lot of debate whether it was really required or not. If I, remember correctly, I read about that problem myself. Um, but uh, are the lives of minks less important than that of humans? Yeah, probably, it's probably true to say that they are less important. Uh, and the kamma that you get from killing a human being is always worse than the kamma you get from killing an animal, yeah? So for that reason, certainly, you could argue that human beings are, are more important. So, can we justify killing animals in this way? And uh, ideally, we would avoid it. Yeah, that is kind of the ideal situation. But sometimes it may be very, very hard. Yeah, the world is sometimes a world of compromises. 
especially if you are part of the government and you have to make big decisions in this way, sometimes there aren't any good decisions. So, you know, sometimes if you have dengue fever, are you going to spray the mosquitoes or are you not? What are you going to do? And sometimes you spray the mosquitoes out of compassion for the people. Yeah. So it also depends how you do it. How do you kill those minks? Do you kill them because you hate minks? Or do you kill them uh, with uh, uh, a kind of heavy heart? You don't really want to kill them because, or you, because you don't see any other way out. Uh, if you kill them because you are angry with the minks, then of course it's bad karma. But if you kill them with a heavy heart because you cannot see any other way out, uh, then the um, karma is not so bad. Uh, the same thing with the mosquitoes with dengue fever. Yeah, It depends how you approach it. Uh, and if you kill it mostly out of compassion for the human beings, uh, then the karma is not going to be so bad. Uh, but if you kill it because you are angry with the mosquitoes for having dengue fever, then the karma is going to be bad. Uh, so the answer is simply that we have to do our best to avoid killing if we can. Uh, and sometimes if we cannot avoid, then you try to have the best possible motivation when you go into these things. Yeah? And you try to deal with it in a way that is... Uh, causes the least problem for yourself and also for the animals that are there. In a life and death situation, one needs to decide between saving an elderly person and a young person. How do you decide and choose without judgment? Um, I guess the question arises whether you really get into these kinds of choices. I'm not sure exactly whether you have a specific situation in mind. But uh, in my experience, it's very, very rare that you have to make these kind of choices. Uh, yeah? Maybe there are some extreme situations where you have to make this kind of choice. Uh, but normally, I think I don't think you have to make a choice. Uh, yeah? And normally, the situation somehow works itself out. Uh, yeah? And something happens which kind of uh, uh, makes the choice not really required. Uh, but maybe what you mean is like a difficult situation, like maybe COVID-19, and you have to either support the child or you have to support the, uh, the elder person yeah, with, with medicine or something like that. Uh, which one do you do or, or, or something of that sort, I mean, that's what you mean. Um, uh, and uh, that's a bit different because then you, you are supporting someone else, so it's a bit different. It's not actually actively killing anyone, so I don't think you can make any bad karma there. Um, I think you have to be more specific. And I think that these kind of choices, they occur so rarely, it is, a, uh, it is very, it's almost not necessary to make a decision on what, what to do, because uh, sometimes when the situation comes, uh, you will know what is the right thing to do. You will feel inside of yourself what feels right, yeah? You will understand what the wisdom is at that time, uh, because every, every one of these situations are slightly different. Uh, every one of them will require a slightly different way of dealing with things. So you have to be, I think, more specific for me to be able to answer that question in a meaningful way. But always remember, it comes back to the idea of motivation. What is that driving? What is it that driving us? Are you being driven by anger? Are you driven by greed or attachment? Or are you driven by compassion? And if you are driven, motivated by compassion, you can never really go wrong. Yeah, this is a, such an important point. So that is really the underlying thing that you need to ask yourself. How does one act morally when confronted with such dilemmas? Well, that's really how you do it. You have to ask yourself uh, what your motivation is. Okay, uh, next one. Dear Arjan, I struggle a lot with sloth and torpor and procrastination. I keep reminding myself to be thankful of this human life and try to sit longer during meditation and not to fall asleep. After trying and trying, I get so exhausted. And for, uh, for my situation, is it because right view is not ingrained? Hence, right effort has not arisen. Thanks. Um, maybe, yeah. It, it is hard to say. Um, people are very different. Some people have a lot of sloth and torpor in this life, a lot of tiredness and lethargy. It is very common for some people. And, uh, uh, you know, if I were you, don't try so hard. Yeah, don't always try. If you try and try and try, you get exhausted. 
And when you get exhausted, the sloth and torpor gets worse. You get even more tired. Yeah? You get even more lethargy because of that. And even more procrastination because of the exhaustion that you already have. So um, don't uh, try too hard. Yeah? If you feel tired, if you have to, allow yourself to be yeah? and see what happens. And as you allow yourself to be tired, just sit with it and see where it leads you. Sometimes it may lead you to less tiredness. Yeah, maybe you start after a while to feel more bright because you allow the tiredness to, uh, to, to come away, to fall away. Uh, and if not, maybe your days are so exhausting. I don't know what kind of day you have, whether you have a family and a job or whatever. But uh, if you have a family and a job, then of course you're going to be tired. Yeah, you're going to always be doing things. And uh, it is going to be very hard to do meditation practice. What you should do then is that you should go on meditation retreats every now and again. Come to Perth, go on in a nice retreat center in Malaysia or, or wherever it is that you are, and then do a retreat for yourself. And then you will find out what is going on. If you go on retreat, then there is a likelihood the tiredness will actually disappear after a few days. If it doesn't disappear after a few days, it means that there is a deeper problem. You, know, you have to go back to the beginning of the path and have to make a better effort in the early factors. You have to, again, be more kind, more generous, and all of these kinds of things. And you have to learn to deal with your mind in a better way. You have this all to do with right view. And then slowly, 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 you will overcome this tiredness and the lethargy that you have. Yeah, so there isn't any, really any one right answer, but uh, you have to try very slowly, gradually to develop out of this uh, uh, of the problem. Uh, also ask yourself whether you are a person who gets angry and upset. Uh, yeah? If you get angry very easily, then that can also, that is also a very strong cause for types and uh, lethargy. So see if you can reduce your anger. See if you can have more meta, more compassion for the people around you. And as you reduce any ill will you have, uh, uh, hopefully that should also help you in overcoming these things. So. Dear Ajahn, since there is no permanent self, how is our kama and imprints of our experience carried from one lifetime to another? And it is carried the five aggregates. Yeah? The mind that goes from one life to the next one. Just like in this life, yeah, in this life, how is it that your memories carry with you? How is it that uh, you uh, feel like you are the same person yesterday as you are today? How is it that you have a history? How is it that all of these things move forward in this life? Well, the way they move in this life is exactly the same way they move from one life to the next one. Because in this life, it is the mind that carries on. Of course, in this life, you have the body as well, but the mind is the main thing, right? The mind is the carrier of your identity, of who you think you are, and all your habits and all of those kinds of things. And because that is the carrier of your personality in this life, that is also the carrier of your personality in your next life. They're the same thing. And this is what carries memories, come up, all of these things along from one life to the next one. Dear Ajahn, my husband said that when he passes on, he would like to be cremated and the ashes thrown in the sea. Some Chinese people believe that if the ashes are thrown in the sea, the soul would have difficulties moving on to the next life. I want to do what is best for my loved one, and I'm wondering what is the right view from a Buddhist perspective. Um, I think the Buddhist perspective is that it does not matter so much what you do with the ashes. Yeah, I, uh, because uh, the, uh, the point is that uh, the person who has died in, uh, in the beginning, they may still be attached maybe to the corpse or to the body. It may take them a bit of time before they kind of get used to the idea of being dead. Yeah, and, uh, but they're not going to be attached to the ashes. Yeah? No, no one is going to be attached to ashes. They don't really matter anymore. So whatever you do to the ashes, I think there is no problem. If you throw them at the sea or you put them at the root of a tree or, or you know, to grow a nice tree or whatever, all of that is really quite, uh, quite irrelevant. Uh, so uh, I think that this maybe is just a 
this cultural belief perhaps yeah and i don't think it is a buddhist belief as such so i don't think you have a there's any problem with that at all uh, so really um, in that case uh, yeah whatever whatever you do i think is is fine uh, the idea of cremation is a very buddhist idea it goes back to the time of the buddha himself yeah the buddha himself was cremated and since then we have been cremating uh, people, because that has been the way uh, the Buddha set, set the example, and we have been doing similar things ever since that. Uh, next question, dear Ajahn, what is the best way to handle people in uh, in your family circle who always say hurtful things to you? What I currently do is not talk to them unless necessary. I think that is a good idea. Yeah, you don't have to talk to people too much. And especially if they are hurtful, uh, even if they are in your family, it is it's awkward. Okay, not, not only okay. I think it is advisable to uh, reduce your contact with them because otherwise you don't have any compassion with yourself. It is so important to have kindness to yourself. And if you know that someone is hurtful, stay pull back. Yeah, stay back. Don't have so much to do with them, but do it with a sense of kindness. Don't do it with a sense of anger because then you're just hurting yourself more and making things even worse. And remember that the person you are talking about probably does not understand what they are doing. Yet. They probably think that they are being funny. They probably think that they are not really hurting you. If they really understood, they wouldn't probably wouldn't be doing these kind of things. Yeah. So um, with withdraw a little bit, uh, but also have compassion at the same time. Uh, and as you withdraw and as you have compassion for the same time, you may be able to find a solution to this. Yeah, maybe down the track, you may be able to have a word with them and say, listen, I may, you know, you may not be aware of this, but actually some of these things that you say are actually very hurtful to me. And, uh, you know, I, I just want you to, to know, and if you are able to change, uh, that would be great. Uh, maybe an opportunity like that will arise in the future. And if the opportunity does not arise, well, then you carry on and, uh, and you will be better off because you have less contact. So I think you're doing exactly what you should be doing. Please look after yourself. It is so important that we do that in this life, uh, but we do it with a bigger, larger understanding of also having compassion for others at the same time. Dear Ajahn, I can appreciate that with the removal of the first factor, we are freed from thinking this body is me and the personality view of I am. Um, uh, but the eighth fetter mana, which is often translated as pride, arrogance, and conceit, still remains even for the anagami. Doesn't that mean even for the anagami, there is I am. I am proud, I am the best, etc. Yes, that, that is exactly what it means. Uh, so again, remember that the difference here is between view and thinking, view and perception, view and notions. View is what you leave behind when you become a stream enter. Yeah. So view, you no longer have the view I am, but sometimes you think I am. So um, and that is the difference here. So the anagami, if you ask the anagami, you ask, what is your view? Is there an I am? The anagami will say, of course, of course, there is no I am, because I've seen that. But still, sometimes I think in terms of that. Uh, and it takes a while before that conceit has been completely let go of. Uh, it is a very subtle difference. Yeah? But uh, again, it's a bit like even for you, yeah, you, you may have a view about something. Uh, but sometimes you may think, if you lose your mindfulness, you may think contrary to that view that you have. Uh, in the same way, an anagami uh, may have a view, but they may think contrary to that view simply because of their uh, habit of the mind. Okay, question number 17. Dear Ajahn, further to your explanation of a stream entry, one of the harder defilements to overcome the defilement of sensual desire. Can one be a stream entry with full right view? To still have craving for sensual desires? And the answer is yes, uh, you can. And there are some examples in the suit as people who were married yeah, and they still had 
ordinary marital relationships uh, uh, as, and there were stream entries there, yeah? so you, this is actually possible. Uh, so, uh, and this is why, you know, the idea of uh, sensual desire is not something terrible, it's not something bad. Uh, in Buddhism, we, are, we, can't, we don't have to feel guilty because of sensual desire. Uh, and this is actually a very important point because sometimes in some religions, these things are kind of, you may feel, feel guilty about these things. Uh, but in Buddhism, the ordinary pleasures of life are perfectly acceptable, uh, yeah, to have an ordinary married life and these kind of things. Uh, the only reason why you give up sensual pleasures, in, according to Buddhism, is because you want to reach a higher kind of pleasure. Yeah? You have to give up the lower pleasure to something higher. And that higher pleasure is the pleasure of samadhi, the pleasure of samatha, the pleasure that comes through meditation practice. And unless you give up the pleasures that come through going out, and all sensual pleasures are about going out into the world, uh, yeah? Uh, so there's all about other people, things that you perceive in the world, because it is about going out to that. Uh, it is contrary to going inside. Uh, so this is why you give it up, uh, yeah? And that is why uh, you, uh, uh, you, and that, that happens fully, uh, even later on on the path. Only when you become an anagami, when you become perfected in samadhi, do you actually give up sense desires completely 100%. But of course, the stream mentor is not going to have very strong sensual desire. It's going to be quite weak. Yeah? It's not going to be a very strong kind of craving for them because they know that real happiness is to be found somewhere else. Yeah? There's going to be something fairly weak. And uh, so there is a kind of gradual reduction in these things uh, because that right view is going to uh, weaken that interest uh, because uh, real happiness uh, is to be found in a different place. Okay, uh, as a lay person working in a big corporation, we are forced to make tough decisions on non-performing staff, resulting in them suffering either from a demotion or a pay cut. As much as we want to practice kindness and compassion, we are forced to implement such dis disciplinary action. Every time that happens, I will justify my action by telling myself I am doing it as an employee, whereas the Buddhist inside of me is not involved. <laughs> am I deceiving myself thinking in such a way? Um, I, you, you have to remember that uh, all of life is integrated. You cannot really separate out your Buddhist self from your employee self. Yeah, these are integrated with each other. I don't know if you are fully deceiving yourself, but maybe a little bit deceiving yourself. But uh, the point is that, you know, sometimes there are tough decisions that are required in this world. We have to make tough decisions. And for example, in the monastery, we may also have non-performing staff in the monastery. Yeah, have you heard about the non-performing staff in the monastery? It is like monks who break the precepts, for example. Yeah, if you break the precept, you have a good Pravajika for a precept, then you are a non-performing staff in the monastery. And if you are a non-performing staff in the monastery, what happens is that you get kicked out. You can't be a monastic anymore. Huh? So sometimes it is just that when we work for a certain corporation, huh? It should be understood by all the staff that if we are not living up to the requirements of the corporation, then this is what happens. So what you should do, the best thing to do is to tell the staff yeah, when they become employees, these are the requirements. Yeah, this is our policy. If you don't meet the requirements, then this is the consequence. And so they come in, they become staff, they know what the consequences are. Yeah? Then it is not, not going to be such a shock to them that they get demoted or they get a pay cut because they will understand that is the culture. In that case, you are just doing uh, what you are supposed to be doing. And you can have compassion for them at the same time. Yeah? You know that getting demoted or getting a pay cut is very painful for people. It is painful for the ego. It is painful because the... Um, we all want to have an increase in salary rather than a decline in salary. So have compassion.
compassion for them. Say that you are terribly sorry, but this is the policy of the company that you're working for. I really, I, I wish I could, could be otherwise, but unfortunately I have to do this with you. Yeah? And maybe sometimes even go to your own superior and say, well, I really value this particular person that had many other qualities. And maybe they haven't been performing in the right way in one way, but maybe they have been performing in another way. Maybe sometimes you can find a loophole, yeah, and you can kind of keep them in the right place. But uh, no, I don't think you have to feel bad about yourself for doing this. Uh, just uh, do it in the right way, do it with kindness, do it with compassion, and then you are doing it in the Buddhist way. Yeah? It is not impossible to combine these things. Uh, and uh, then I think you will be able to integrate uh, being an employee with also being a Buddhist. Uh, so try that and see, see what happens. Sir. Dear Arjan, I didn't know that being late was a psychological problem. Thanks for this information. It is so true for me. I try to my very best to be early, but it is always difficult. There will always be an obstacle, and many are not as understanding like you, Ajahn, and many hurtful remarks are made. Would meditation help me overcome this? If yes, I appreciate Ajahn's guidance on this. <laughs> Okay, that, that's marvelous. I'm very glad we brought this up because it is quite common, yeah, to be late. It happens for the fairly large percentage of the population. So because there are over 100 participants on the retreat, it is quite likely that it will be probably not just you, probably quite a few people who are procrastinators yeah, on this retreat. So uh, what I, if I were you, I meditation can probably help, but uh, what you would what you should really try to do is try to understand why this is happening to you. Yeah? What is the reason why you're always late? And if you look very carefully, you should be able to investigate your own psychology and try to understand why you are uh, doing this. So I would also recommend you, if you find it hard to investigate and understand yourself well, if you go online, there is a lot of uh, wonderful information online now. If you go to a recognized source, don't go to fake news, but go to real news, yeah? And find a good article that talks about these kind of things. And then you might get an insight into your own psychology, because we are all human beings. We all have basically the same psychology, yeah? So if a psychologist understands and it's one person they will understand others as well and try to read some of those articles and you may be able to start to understand what it is going on inside of you why you are being late and once you have understood the problem then you maybe have had the beginning also finding the solution to that particular problem yes meditation may help but what you really need to understand is why you are doing this. What is the psychological mechanism that makes you uh, do uh, this sort of thing again and again and again? Then you're going to be on the right track. And I'm sure that if you really want to, I'm sure you will be able to overcome this problem and you will be moving in the right direction. Okay, one last question for today. Uh, dear Ada, in legal documents, uh, we always ensure our company's interest is fully protected. These may be disadvantageous to the other party. If the other party overlooked and did not ask for the wordings to be changed, uh, is this against right speech or right action? Okay. Uh, I think that, um, you, you know, you... Um, <laughs> You have a legal document and uh, you, uh, you you give it to the other party. It is you could argue that it is their their job to look at that document in the right way. You know it is a little bit tricky, yeah, because we are, obviously we are kind of we are, we're almost sometimes we are hoping that the other party won't see the disadvantageous clause maybe in the legal document that that maybe down the track they will be. So it is a little bit dodgy. Huh? It is a little bit like trying to deceive people a little bit. Huh? But uh, because it is all written down, it is all there on black and white, uh, they should be able to see these things. Yeah, they, they, it is really there um, 
fault if they don't look properly. So I don't think it is a bad thing. Yeah. But in the ideal world, yeah, outside of le legal documents for companies in our private lives, uh, we should try to avoid these kind of things. We should try to be upfront about things uh, and to say things as they are. Yeah. And um, if it happens in the legal world because it's just too hard to avoid, uh, so big. I don't think I don't think it's a big problem. I don't think it's a big moral issue. If it can be changed, change it because it is even better. If it cannot be changed, I don't think it is a terrible thing. Yet. I don't think you're doing something extraordinarily evil, but maybe a little bit on the gray side. Yeah, not perfectly moral, not very immoral, maybe somewhere in between. Okay, everyone, uh, marvelous to be with you all again. And as always, I wish you a very good night and a good afternoon and a good evening. Uh, keep on doing whatever you feel is right. Have a good rest. And uh, before we call it a day, maybe we should just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha like we did, did yesterday. It might be a nice thing to do. So let's just do the Arahant Sama Sambuddha together. Arahang Sama Sambuddha Bhagava Bodhang Bhagavantang Abhivadene Svakato Bhagavatadamo Dhammang Namasame Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami. He bows to our chant, please. Okay, good night, everyone. See you again tomorrow morning, Kevin. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ajahn.